Hello and welcome to part three of my video tutorial series on how to create a simple um, cave battle map using GIMP um, for the purposes of tabletop role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder. Um, I've got part one and two linked in the description below. Part one mainly just did or focused on um, setting up your image with the appropriate resolution size for virtual tabletops um, like Roll20 or Foundry VTT. Um, and some basic line work and then part two dealt with colors and shading um, and, and throughout parts one and two it brings you up right into the point of, of what you see here with this map um, and, and in this video I'm going to cover adding some um, rock texture to the walls I'm going to be um, penciling in and coloring a bunch of um, rubble and, and boulders um, on the floor itself and then I'm going to show you a couple of tricks um, um, kind of throughout um, that will be applicable to to any kind of map you want to make so um, that being said let's get into it so um, adding texture to the walls I wanted uh, similar to how we added texture to the floors here um, aside from just putting shading along the walls we added texture to the floors I want to do the same thing for the walls so um, this is another GIMP um, standard brush it's called cell 01 it's located right here um, opacity make sure it's around 25 26 that's where I put it and the size was in and around the 500s um, and so again to add texture we want to create a new layer and I'm going to appropriately call it texture dash walls we're going to change its blending mode to overlay similar to how we did the texture layer down here for the floor and also how we did the shading for everything as well so now that you've, you've you've created your new layer here uh, and because it's in this layer group as we covered in in video two um, because it's in this group it's it's only going to affect this base layer below it um, it's not going to affect anything else which is what we want so um, so yeah this brush setting and the only other thing I would say is uh, right off the hop you're going to want to turn this layer opacity down to like 35 or so and then similar to how we did before with with the brush we just kind of stamp it around a bit not worrying too much if there's overlap or if there's gaps um, because when you're dealing with this low of opacity you're not going to notice it um, you're not going to notice the messiness of it you're just going to notice the overall effect that's achieved and you can already see it here I'm just tapping every once in a while ensuring you know a reasonable level of coverage and it's you can see how it's already added a bit of a texture in the background that in my opinion is good enough um, to make it to give it a, a bit of a rocky texture so that's pretty much it for that um, so yeah and you can I mean if you really wanted to see the effect of it and you wanted to turn up the opacity and you wanted that effect to be more pronounced by all means you can crank up the opacity there you can crank up the opacity of your brush setting itself and then you're dealing with really harsh um, harsh brush strokes um, but it's my personal preference to keep it down um, down here where it's 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 noticeable but it's subtle okay uh, the next thing I wanted to cover was adding um, rocks and rubble so uh, before I even begin to add new layers I always try and think about logically where we want to place them in the the layer hierarchy here so um, obviously we want all of the rubble to be sitting above the floor so we know it's going to sit somewhere higher than these three um, now the grid layer is a different consideration to make it's my personal preference that um, certain features would sit above the grid and certain features are going to sit below the grid to me props that sit on the floor I like to raise them up above the grid um, there's no rhyme or reason of as to why I just prefer to do it that way and, and then it to me the grid and and the fact that there's certain things in front of it and behind it um, adds a bit more depth to the image so that's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna create a new layer just above the grid I should mention whenever you create new layers it always puts that new layer directly above the one that you've got selected so I've got the grid layer selected here you hit new layer when I fill this out and hit OK it's going to put it right above the grid layer and switch my active layer to the new one that I created and I'm gonna switch back to my hardness 75 brush which is my favorite 
I'm going to move my brush size to an 8. And all I'm basically going to do is just, I'm going to work at about this level of zoom, maybe a, a bit further in. And I'm just going to kind of, kind of mostly near the walls, I'm just going to add, you know, some circular objects, maybe some more with some jagged edges. Um, you can have a few that overlap too, like you could do something like this. But I'm basically going to go across the entire map and just dot in these bits of rubble as I see fit. Um, every once in a while, I'll probably zoom out just to get an idea of, you know, on average, how congested the map is getting based on how many um, rocks and stones and pebbles that I'm drawing in. And I'll always kind of zoom out and, and, and gauge that as I go along. So. Uh, one thing I can tell you guys too is uh, if you're using um, some sort of drawing tablet or if you're using um, keyboard shortcuts for your zooming in and zooming out, um, your zooming in and out always um, centers itself on your, or behaves differently based on where you have your mouse cursor. So if I if I zoom out like this and I move my mouse cursor over here and hit start hitting zoom in, it's going to start honing in on where my mouse is placed. Whereas if I put my mouse over here and start zooming in, it starts following that as well. So um, depending on your preference, whether you want to pan around or if you want to zoom out and then zoom back in um, to constantly take a take a check of your of your surroundings, um, that's an easy way of kind of panning while also zooming. Um, it serves a dual purpose that way. So just a little tip for you guys. Okay, so um, that that just about does it there with the with the rubble. Um, you'll notice I, I keep the, kind of the centers of the rooms and the hallways um, fairly clean. I like to I like to have the actual playing area or the the area that's most likely to be played by the players um, to be more or less clean and open, um, rather than having it too cluttered, um, especially for unimportant features like rubble. So, um, okay, so that's the line work, and just like we colored the walls and the floors we're going to make use of the fuzzy select tool. So the first thing we do is we want to create our new layer to accommodate the base color for the rubble. So that's just going to sit underneath the line layer and then we're going to switch back to the line layer, grab our fuzzy select tool, click outside um, the rubble and that's important to do that um, because that way it's going to grab everything that's not the rubble currently. Uh, whereas if you weren't to do that that way, then you'd have to click every single piece of rubble inside while holding shift. Um, and that could, I mean, you, it'll work that way, but this is much quicker. So you grab everything that's not rubble, you go select and grow to again accommodate, um, accommodate for that thin little strip. So select grow, and I'm going to choose four pixels. Now, bear in mind, we're still selecting everything that's not the rubble right now. So we've, we've selected outside, we've selected, we've done a grow, and now we need to invert the selection. So now what we're left with is all, every single piece of rubble selected, um, and, and taking into account the line thickness as well. So now we can go over to the base layer. Um, choose our bucket fill tool and actually we don't know what color yet to fill it because if you'll remember um, I had a couple of predetermined colors chosen for the map when I originally um, did part one of this tutorial and it was a couple of just uh, a dark gray or a dark brown and a, and, a, and a light brown I don't have those colors saved anymore so a quick way and plus I, I changed the color since then I changed the walls to a gray and the floors to more of a red um, so an easy way to, to pick a color that's, that matches the, the kind of the current motif is use your, your color picker tool and you can do sample merged 
Um, this selection, what this ends up doing is if you're going to sample merged, what that does is it merges or it samples a color that you're clicking here as though every single layer of yours was merged and flattened into one single image. So it's going to take into account all of the shading, all of the line work, everything, right? So if you click over here, it's going to turn into this dark red. If you click over here, it's going to turn into the uh, light pale red. If you click over here, it'll be a dark brown or a dark gray, sorry. Over here, it'll be a light gray. So what I like to do with my rubble is I usually like to color it the same or roughly the same as my walls. So I'm going to pick a gray that's kind of middle of the road in this gradient from dark to light. I'm going to grab that. That looks good. And then make sure that your cursor, see how the icon changes? Make sure your cursor is inside your selection. And as soon as you click it once, it should fill every single um, individual selection. There. And you can go select none or you can go control shift A to remove your selection. And there you go. You've colored every single piece of rubble and the colors match um, match the colors that you selected for your walls and floors. Um, so that's how you can quickly color things and that's how you quickly recover some colors that you have or some of the color palette that you've used on the map even if you didn't happen to save them in your in your quick select um, uh, area here so um, the only other thing I want to show you in this in this part was um, like the walls I want this rubble to have a little bit of a shadow it's not obviously it's not nearly as tall as the walls because the walls would at least be as high as um, you know eight or ten feet um, and so would cast larger shadows and then would would account for deeper shadows um, but the rubble should have something to to kind of make it look like it's sitting on top of the floor and not just kind of floating um, so I could do what I did in part two and flip over to my my texture hose brush throw down the opacity and I could you know create a new layer um, call it shadows or shading if I can type from rubble I could set that to be an overlay layer and I could just go ahead and you know one by one I could add some shading underneath here each one but you can imagine that would take considerable amount of time and it it doesn't have I mean you can do it this way one of the ways I prefer to do it I'm just gonna clear out what I've done is you can actually go back to that selection that you'd made um, by right clicking on your base layer which remember your base layer all it is is those chunks of gray um, that are tucked behind all of that line work and if you right click on it and go alpha to selection what it's going to do is it's going to take your selection and make it um, anything that's on this layer that isn't just purely transparent anything that has an alpha value basically so anything that has been painted will be, become part of the selection so you go ahead and do that and it calls up that selection again and then um, then you get your shading tool out and make sure that these brush settings are roughly what you want them to be so I'm gonna actually you can see a little preview of the thickness of your brush here I'm gonna actually expand that a bit that makes a bit more sense and you'll see I'm running my mouse along the edge of the selection and that's important to know because once you figure out how opaque you want it and how big of, of, a, of a brush stroke you want it once you have your selection made make sure you switch to your shading layer and go edit stroke selection so what this is going to do is it's going to take your paint tool with its current settings and it's going to automatically just give one shot all the way along every single line of this selection so that's going to be every single piece of rubble and you'll see the effect of this as soon as I click this so there you go it's already got a little bit of a shadow if you zoom out you can kind of see the overall effect of it I'm actually going to remove the selection so it's easier to see 
So you can see each each piece of rubble has a little bit of a drop shadow underneath it now, which is pretty good. I like it to be a bit more pronounced than that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call up that selection again. Um, I'm going to create a larger brush stroke because I want it to go a bit further out than the last time. But I want the effect to stack, so I still want to keep what we did already down here. I just want to add on to it. So what will happen is when, when the next stroke selection happens, it's going to take that same amount of opacity of that, expand it out wider, and then that strip itself is going to get darker because you're stacking the effects of two brush strokes. So edit stroke selection. And make sure you've got stroke with the paint tool selected, not stroke line, because stroke line is a very basic one. Stroke with the paint tool with your settings here set up is what you want to do. There. So that's pretty decent. I mean, if you want, if you wanted to be really thorough, you could go and, and do it all by hand yourself, and you'd have a bit more smoothing around here, and it'd look a bit smoother, like the edges of the walls look. Um, but this, I mean, this works perfectly fine for me. So that's it for part three of this video tutorial series. Uh, it's a bit shorter and sweeter than the other two, but I think that's a good thing. Um, going forward, I'm going to be making um, smaller bite-sized chunks for the this cave battle map, and then um, I'll be doing tutorials of other types of battle maps in the future. Um, I also want to do sm short little um, micro tutorials explaining certain key features of GIMP. So um, things like the color picker, like the stroke selection, I want to go into detail a bit more to make sure that you guys understand those concepts. So uh, be sure to like and subscribe to this video, um, subscribe to the channel so that uh, when I do um, come up with more tutorials, um, you guys are the first to know. So thanks for watching and uh, have a good day.